Hello, and welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Leo Zhang, founder of Alchemia Protocol, a project that brings Bitcoin mining into the DeFi ecosystem through its novel use case of smart contracts. This podcast is presented ad-free by Compass Mining, the largest marketplace for Bitcoin mining. Check out compassmining.io today if you want to buy, sell, or host an ASIC. And now, onto the show. Leo, welcome back to the show. It's been, I think, six months since you were last on. Uh, thankful for you to join back on and tell us about Alchemia Protocol. Thanks for having me. And I, I think I butchered it in June last time we spoke as well, but correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. It's Alchemia, right? Alchemia. Yes, that, that's how I pronounce it. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are multiple ways to pronounce it. So it doesn't really matter. There we go. Okay. As long as I got it right off the top, that's all that matters to me. Uh, so yeah, let's just kind of start off with what you've been up to since like the, the beta has gone into live production. Uh, you've written a really nice blog post on consensus markets. Uh, I think that came out in January. We'll link in today's show notes for sure. Just about how there is a new market for hash rate and you guys are building it over at Alchemia Protocol. So we are on testnet. All the basic functionalities of the base contracts are there. Uh, feel free to test it. The UI the UI still needs a lot of work because uh, we haven't uh, had had a chance to to actually had uh, get a designer to look at it. So uh, I drew all the components myself, and I'm not exactly trained. Yeah. So so actually, our last version uh, is basically a P2P contracts where miners they issue a contract uh, through through their mining pool, and uh, they have to input their mining ID miner ID of specific mining pool that we have already onboarded. We have to fetch that information, make sure, okay, uh, the hash rate being, is actually being produced. Um, so during this process, we realized, okay, this is really not ideal because um, uh, it's just a lot of onboarding work to to work with each individual mining pools and mining pools, they get shut down and I just throw away all the work uh, that I've been doing for, for a long time. And and also each contract is not fungible, even though they, they have the exact same term, right? Because the 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 uh diff, you know different time of the day and um in in the con and, and different mining pools that they, they really make these contracts not fungible uh, compared to each other so uh, during this process we, just, we, we, we realized okay um either we touch the mining pool infrastructure we, we get very deep um entangled into how mining pool works um and how each individual miner work on each individual mining pools uh, or we just do a pure financial abstraction doesn't touch any of the mining pool infrastructure doesn't touch any of the physical mining at all everything synthetic everything gets settled in coins uh, so we decided to take that after assessing our strength and weaknesses and uh what we like and what we don't like we decided to take the full financial abstraction route um so the contracts in Alchemia, these are, uh, when I say synthetic hash rate, uh, what I mean is you just show up with coins. And so let's say you issue a contract, a 10 giga hash contract for over the next 15 days. So every day you just show up with what 10 giga hash uh, dictate that you've been, uh, that is supposed to, to deliver. Right? So as long as you can uh, deliver that amount of coins, your contract is live. Um, so it doesn't really care if you mine those contracts. Of course, if you actually have 10 giga hash, that's the that best, right? Because you can uh, match them up. Um, but if you don't, that's fine. You can borrow the coins to to fill up the differences. Or you, if you already have coins uh, before entering the contract, that's fine. Alchemy doesn't care. Um, this also opens up the seller base um, such that miners can hedge, can capture premium uh, hash power, but if you're someone who just uh, likes to participate in all of these kind of arbitrage opportunities and you have a lot of coins to play with um, and you realize, OK, hash power is trading at a premium and you can't want to take advantage of that, uh, you can just sell coins. You can borrow coins to sell it uh, as long as you can you know, uh, manage the, the risk. Um, because I, th I think just limiting the protocol, the supply side to uh, the seller base, it's a uh, it's going to it's going to bottleneck its growth at some point. Um, so yeah, so hence this design. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating, and I've been going through some of your blog posts detailing the the thought that went into this project beforehand. Of course, we'll link it in the show notes, and everyone who's interested in the project should definitely take them out. Uh, even if you're just interested in Bitcoin mining, there's some very deep research and thought that's gone into all these blog posts. So be sure to read them. Uh, the thing that's been interesting to me is thinking about the centralization versus the decentralization uh, 
problem and how Alchemia is able to fix the centralized issue with hash rate tokens or cloud mining or some sort of uh, OTC buy of hash rate because it's decentralized, like the decentralized nature of the, of the agreement there. Can you kind of walk us through that buyer and seller problem in a decentralized aspect? Who's the buyer here? Who's the seller of the hash rate? How are they brought together through the smart contract? And, and why does the uh, decentralized nature of that smart contract make sure that everyone gets what they want at the end of the day? Yeah, so I think I think these are very different products. Uh, despite that, they the the marketing language the, it's it's more or less the same. They involve the, uh, a, a basket of the same words, right? Um, but I, I think the the cloud mining contract from Bitdeer or the Blockstream mining notes uh, that that's one category. Or OTC hash rate products, they're just entirely their own category. Um, the reason Alchemy is different. Uh, well, first of all, let's let's talk about them first. Um, so the financial abstraction of hash power is, is a pretty natural process, uh, as we've seen in all commodity production business, right? It's the same kind of economics. Of course, there's going to be some kind of abstraction. Uh, however, I think pushing it uh, directly to buyers is not going to get the kind of volume that you expect. Just simply turning something into a contract or turning them into tokens is not going to create a market automatically. Um, I think this is inherently because the pricing of these instruments are so complex. We've been talked about this topic many, many times in the blog post, or just people who have done mining would know. Um, and uh, and I think that complexity favors the miners uh, instead of the buyers because if you know so much about mining, why why don't you just run your own rigs, right? Why don't you just do it yourself? Like, why the fuck are you? Sorry, uh, what? Uh, why? Yeah. Yeah, why the fuck are you buying like contracts from other people that that already built in a certain amount of like premium? Um, and as for sellers, uh, it, it's not ideal because you are kidnapped into these contracts uh, as well, right? The term of the contract you price these things uh, in bull market, you or you price these things in bear market. So either way, you're going to suffer when the when the face change. Um, so either you know in bear market you're obligated to deliver that amount of uh, hash power right or you default. We've seen in pooling's um, I don't remember the name of that project. So uh, China ban happened. The project is just is gone. Um, uh, the same kind of risk uh, would happen for any other kind of these platforms as well. And of course, uh, a reasonable or a responsible project would try to f make up the difference by um, f paying from their own pocket, but it's just not sustainable, right? You want to build something in crypto. You want to build something that can keep running long after you're dead. The founder's dead. The management is dead. And this project can evolve, can carry on, can have, um, yeah, mechanism to, 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 to be on its own. Right. Uh, instead of like a management team, just, just micromanaging every, every aspect of it, but that's, that's beside the point. So as a seller, you either have to commit to the entire duration of these contracts, and when the market changes, it just really doesn't favor your economics. And um, and frankly, for most of these projects, as a seller, you can't participate at all because you need to ship your machine to a dedicated uh, colocation center right, or a certain data center. You give up the control of the machines to someone else. And this can go many ways. Uh, and of course, the nice thing about um, that model, the traditional cloud mining hash rate token model, is that you, there's always someone you can sue if things go wrong. And for for you know a lot of uh, the older people, right? Uh, uh, it, it's uh, there's a sense of comfort in that, and that's that's how they they're used to dealing doing business that way. And uh, I, frankly, I don't blame them. If I were you know 60 year old, uh, I would prefer to do business that way as well. So I think for um, uh, as we, we see now more energy guys come into this this game um and and they don't really care about the uh the ec well they, the, the only thing they care about is the is the economics of it right they want the price everything in usd they don't really some of them don't really care about bitcoin at all right? it's just okay great another way to enhance yield on, on on my energy so for them it's it's impossible to tell them okay you onboard this DeFi protocol you get this metamask thing so that's impossible um, for now. And so, uh, yeah, so I think they belong, they're the natural users for the, uh, this category of product. Um, 
this it, it just it, it gives them someone to sue when things go wrong or just someone to call when they don't understand certain things um yeah that's why i said it's a it's a completely different experience hence a completely different category of product but whereas for for a smart contract base uh thing right there's funny a pure financial abstraction um i think it's just part of the DeFi universe it's part of where uh, yield comes from and and, and uh, this was this is a big topic where yield come from in the DeFi universe so so far we've seen a lot of exciting projects right a lot of very interesting primitive um, but a, a key assumption here is, okay, where is the underlying cash flow coming from? Where is it, is it sustainable? Uh, most of these projects, uh, even though they replicate uh, some features of traditional finance well, or they just you know come up with an entirely new primitive, the problem is the yield comes from either some form of very inefficient lending activities or just the value of a basket of shit coins. And of course, the 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 impermanent loss has just been just people just forgot about it right? <laughs> very conveniently. Um, yeah. So, what is the only one thing that truly represents a scalable, healthy, relatively steady uh, source of yield that's boring, but it's always there? Uh, the only thing that we 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 can rely on is that okay, as long as the blockchain propagates, as long as there are new block, there is going to be block subsidy. There's going to be fees. So um, only these cash flow that's being accrued on the block space itself. This is the only thing that you know is always going to be there. And of course, you don't know its value, right? You don't because it's inherently tied to difficulty. It's it's uh, different pool payouts, fees at different times, uh, but you know it's there. It's there. So, if you want to construct something that that mildly resembles like fixed income or some kind of like periodic payment, uh, and uh, and of course you just kind of have to. If if DeFi universe is really going to scale to even a fraction of uh, the global fixed income market, I'm talking about you know U.S. bond, U.S. It's just treasuries and uh, corporate bonds. Um, even if it wants to scale to a fraction of that 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 market, it needs to have some resemblance of of uh, stability, right? Um, so so the only thing, the only thing, in the absence of some kind, any kind of like uh, credit rating, and I'm sure people try to develop that, but it's just not very crypto native, right? It's not crypto native. You, just, you have you have a third party, you have. Uh, I'm sure you can get very good companies like Gauntlet, smart people to evaluate a project, but put a stamp on it. But um, if you want to do it in a crypto native fashion, the only steady cash flow is the cash flow coming from consensus. Um, so with that in mind, I think this primitive solves problem on two seemingly parallel universes, a group of people that just never talk to each other. One group is these hardcore miners and uh, these many men, and they're just doing their own thing. Uh, but uh, coming to this and thinking, oh, how do I hedge against my risk? And uh, because they, they've seen all these things, all, they've been playing this game so long in, uh, in the energy market, right? And of course, you need energy swap, you need futures and options to lock in your price. Um, and uh, and there's just so there's no real good instruments for you to 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 be able to do that, right? Um, and on the other side, you have all these a universe of DeFi DGens, um, DGens or just large massive funds, massive massive funds sitting on you know hundreds of millions and billions worth of stable coins, are looking for a passive and boring way to to scale. Treasuries, right? There's just treasury of these uh, DAOs are getting massive. They're looking for a relatively less controversial way to grow their collateral, grow their insurance funds, et cetera. Um, but, but yeah, they can't. They, and what they have in common is this cash flow. Yeah. So I think what Alchemy does is, and, and of course, we have all these fancy marketing words like consensus capital markets. But in essence, in essence, is making creating this translation process uh, to turn the cash flow from these um, mining activities or staking activities into something that buyers understand. Totally. And I, I want to go back to the DeFi conversation because I think that is a really nice parallel here where you have this underlying, you have this network that relies on the sale of tokens to basically fund itself, right? So I think compound finance is a good example of this where the only reason it kind of works is because of this token that you get 
on behalf of lending and you get basically like your interest paid out in the native token, the native tokens worth is often only there because retail is buying it. So it is very self-referential in that way. There's some other things obviously that go into it. Uh, besides that, it's probably an unfair summary but it does seem like there is some missing base component to a lot of these DeFi applications. And they're, they're missing like this, uh, exactly what you're kind of describing, some sort of cash flow asset that has a little bit more basis in reality, like Bitcoin mining or like Ethereum mining, where you have real assets being used up in the mining process and the proof of work process. And then you have uh, that hash rate being put into a system and being able to financialize it. How do you see this kind of moving over into different ecosystems, though? I saw that in one of your blog posts, you were interested in moving uh, Alchemia into proof of stake systems, which was it kind of caught me off guard a little bit uh, because I didn't suppose that you were interested in that. But maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do remember seeing that earlier today when I was looking around. Uh, given that Alchemia is a full uh, a financial abstraction, right? Uh, so, so like I described, you just show up with coins. Um, so it doesn't really matter how these coins are being produced because we don't touch the source of the coin production. So it doesn't matter to the protocol that if it's produced in you know via proof of work or proof of stake, as long as we can establish that okay, uh, this is the amount of coins you have to deliver today and tomorrow. That that's that's you know what, the the requirement. Um, so in the sense that it, it has. It's it's a layer of abstraction above uh, the consensus mechanism itself, right? Because we don't actually interact with any of the infrastructure that tell us what to do there. Um, so that I mean, that's the rationale. It's just very easy to replicate to, uh, sorry, to duplicate this to for proof of stake projects. Very easy to do any kind of, um, yeah source of cash flow as long as we can properly establish the 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 index which is uh in proof of works case is okay um eth produced per giga hash per day that's very easy to do um but for some of the uh very various version of proof of state project that tend to be a little harder okay coin stake per day uh there's uh, kinds of time to build in so that's the hardest part um but as long as we can build an index that sort of resembles uh, the equivalent of uh, coins produced per giga hash per day, uh, then then we're good. Um, and of course, this needs to be. There's no black box in this. Everything needs to be uh, as on chain as possible. Um, so yeah, that's the rationale. Okay, awesome. That makes more a little bit more sense there. Going back to the DeFi example again, I just kind of want to tie up that conversation a bit more. So there is an interesting thing within these proof of stake systems or within DeFi protocols in general that you see there's farming for tokens, there's bonding or there's staking. And it's almost always essentially the same thing where you're using a native token, putting into the project, using it as a, some sort of security or maybe like you're lending against it, depending on the system, of course, and you're getting an asset back for that. It seems very similar to what's happening here. How would you differentiate the two, like hash rate going into an ecosystem and what we've seen in DeFi or what we've seen in these proof of stake systems where you're putting a token into it and getting a token out of it. In, in Alchemia, what I'm seeing is that you're using hash rate kind of pinned into a protocol and then you're swapping it for stable coins on the other side. And you seem to be saying that you can build a DeFi primitive off of this hash rate exchange in the same way that these token ecosystems are using that swapping of capital on the base layer for, or on the base layer rather, you're swapping that capital for a native token that is going to be purchased by retail or purchased by others. I can rephrase that question if that went off the rail a little bit. But. I think I get it. I think I get it. Um, so the uh, if I can you know, try to... Uh, rephrase what you said. So a lot of these DeFi primitives, right? The the plumbing, the way that plumbing uh, works is that you keep issuing a new token. And uh, in theory, some of this new token represents the underlying, but let's be honest, that that, that connection is lost. So when we build these uh, layers, uh, the, the plumbing is the what we want to carry to the other side, the actual underlying coins or, or, or relation transaction relations that we want to uh, carry from one side to the other is utterly lost in this process of layering. Um, so as a result, you end up with token that is uh, just a scaffolding of self-referential uh, layers. 
Um, and, uh, and of course you can explain on paper how these scaffolding works, but, but in, in practice, when, uh, when liquidity is lost on specific layers, it just, the whole thing just collapses. Um, so whereas in this case, the going from one side, the seller side to the, to the ultimate, uh, end user side, uh, we can carry the underlying, which in this case is uh, WBTC or ETH, or of course wrapped ETH, uh, we can carry these cash flow all the way through the plumbing to the end user. So end user, when it comes to to, to Alchemia, uh, and when they think uh, when they are interacting with these uh, like vaults or whatever, uh, they know they will be getting the actual underlying coins, um, and uh, and there is. Um, uh, the the way that these calculations work are, are 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 verifiable. You can see every step of the process how it works. Um, I don't know if that that is what you are getting at. Totally, totally, yeah. But just to rephrase it for myself and maybe for the audience, what it seems is like these DeFi tokens, like the USD value, if we're going to normalize it in USD terms, it, it depends on market sentiment. But the market for alchemia seems to be dependent on the demand for block space, and that demand for block space is is bound up in demand for the network, and so it seems like a little bit more of a rigid product to work on top of. Uh, that would be one way I'd kind of maybe explain it to myself. Um, but we can leave that conversation there because I, I am interested in moving to, over to Bitcoin mining and how this works for for Bitcoin specifically. Obviously, DeFi is still a buzzword in most altcoin circles. What does your project look like for Bitcoin mining in the future? Has there been a lot of research on that side? Are you finding that it's difficult to build on top of Bitcoin, this kind of protocol? I see that a lot of others have had trouble. That's why there's RSK. That's why there's Liquid. That's why there's Stacks, because everyone's been having trouble building on top of Bitcoin to date. I think for Bitcoin mining, uh, at, in a short or even medium term future, uh, we need a third party. We need a centralized party to, to do the onboarding. I don't think uh, Bitcoin miners are particularly interested in even. It doesn't really matter. I mean, if it's onboarding to RSK or DLC or to like whatever the fuck altcoin platform uh, this thing is mm-hmm. built on, right? It's the same to them. And the and the the complication here is just uh, one. Of course, is technical and the user experience. It requires like doing little hops. And as a small fraction of these miners, they are maybe they're interested in experimenting this. But uh, this goes back to something we were talking about earlier. You want somebody to call. You want somebody to sue when things go wrong. Um, and I think uh, you know because the background of the most Bitcoin miners today, uh, I think this is naturally going to be the way that they want to conduct business for in a short and medium term. It's just yeah, institution to institution. Um, so the way I'm approaching that that base is I'm trying to work with uh, uh, partners, partners who offer. Uh, financial services to miners who have already who can put a face to its projects. So from their perspective, and and this this is how uh, a lot of commodities markets work as well. Right, you have these public markets where things are priced uh, and traded in a public fashion. But most of the users, most of the airlines, when it comes uh, when it comes to actual hedging, they go through a customization uh, process. So they, they talk to a bank or talk to a broker um, and they want something very specific. So the intermediary, the OTC desk, the trader, they can use Alchemia as the back as the backend um, mm-hmm. and they can do the customization uh, themselves, right? They can break the order into several pieces or they can long a part of it, short a part of it. Uh, they can use uh, multiple uh, different instruments to patch the whole experience. So from the miners' pr- perspective, okay, I'm selling this much hash rate. This is what I'm getting. That's all you need to know. Um, and of course, this this cannot be done directly on Alchemia because it will require you to wrap the coin and uh, do the onboarding itself. I think, yeah, I think uh, the onboarding Bitcoin miner is, is that the onboarding process is the challenge. Everything else is already there. Right? It's the same kind of logic. Mm-hmm. It's the same kind of process. Um, it's just, okay, how do you convince to, to, to do the onboarding? I don't think it's worth my um, resource to pursue that, to build that onboarding port. It's just because it's like banging my head on the wall. Um, yeah. Uh, it's just, I'm just saying that it's just not like what our our team is built up to do. So it makes much yeah. more sense to to partner with uh, existing uh, companies that can offer that kind of white glove services. Do you think that there's a market for it right now? Like if there was a market for like a, a larger market for this 
at the moment you wouldn't have to do any onboarding just people would come to your doors yeah i think there's a desire but i think the hesitation is yeah is is, a lot of it comes from okay how this thing is set up and uh the onboarding process uh is part of the 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 contribution to um the hesitation so i think also just uh the in order for for a bitcoin miner to understand this they have to study a lot of things right they have to study how this works and get comfortable with the mechanism that's much easier if um I do the education process with a trader, right? and um, um, and they go through the education and, and the trade and, and the company that is so in their business so ingrained with uh, working with providing financial services to minor to do. Uh, okay, this is what you need to do, and this is what we give you. Because ideally, ideally, the most perfect experience is the Bitcoin miner who is often you know an energy guy um, that that just care about. Okay, this is what I'm spending this month. And this is how much I'm getting this month. Uh, can we lock that in? And and uh, and this is my requirement. And they tell that to uh, one of these, you know, our trading partners. That in and they look at the the, the requirement. They think, okay, uh, we'll have to break this into these pieces. And uh, this is how we construct. Uh, we structure this whole deal on um, uh, on uh, this whole trade on Alchemia. Several steps. Uh, they do all that, and they come back with uh, the the desired outcome. Uh, for the miner, so the miner doesn't need to know there's a back end process that doesn't need to know okay how this uh, whole thing like happened, um, but their experience is uh, yeah what I just described input output yeah definitely I mean just from my experience talking with some in the minor financing industry I think there definitely is an interest in smoothing out those revenue curves over time. Because that implicitly helps your cost curves, right? To be able to kind of spread out all these things. It's traditionally just been a very boom bust cycle. Since Bitcoin mining is a pay to play on, on Bitcoin itself, you just have to deal with those uh, bears and bulls a little bit differently than everybody else. So it would make sense to have something like this. Uh, Leo, as we're just kind of closing out the conversation here, where can people find your work uh, either on Twitter or your blog or maybe other podcasts? Yeah, uh, alchemia.io um, uh, and join our Discord. Awesome. I'm in that Discord. It's a good one. Always interesting conversations there. But Leo, thank you so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.